you know, this is an enormous concentration of power of wealth and it can't be done away with instantly. But I still think that by encouraging other forms of wealth building and of uh, banking, you can start to chip away at that power. You are listening to Damn the Absolute, a podcast about our relationship to ideas. Produced by Eradicus. Here's your host, Jeffrey Howard. Welcome, friends, philosophers, and fellow practitioners of ideas. This is episode two of Damn the Absolute. In the process of creating political worldviews, there are a variety of values we integrate and use as foundational. Liberty, equality, fraternity, and solidarity are commonly held political values in the United States and Europe. But what might it look like for one to create a political worldview informed by uncertainty, not just as a reality of life to be accepted, but even as a central guiding principle in one's politics? Today, I'm talking with Daniel Wartell London. Daniel is a historian of urban economics and political economy based in New York City. He received his PhD from NYU in 2020. Together, we will examine how a cadre of thinkers around the turn of the 20th century, including the pragmatist philosopher John Dewey, created a political, ethical, and philosophical framework with uncertainty at its center. We'll consider the benefits and dangers of a politics of uncertainty and what we can do to engage with uncertainty in an intelligent and non-dogmatic way. I hope you'll contribute to the conversation. Daniel, welcome to the show. Uh, it's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm glad we were able to connect online recently around questions of democracy and community. And here we are talking John Dewey and amongst a bunch of other things. Yeah, no, it's amazing how Twitter has brought together all of these pragmatists out of the woodwork. It's almost like the consequences of social media aren't entirely terrible. Yeah, yes, that that is exactly right. It's not a, a complete loss. I think there's a lot of benefits that we're finding here. I'd like to start out, and this is definitely sets a tone for what we're going to talk about. What is a viewpoint that you have held in adulthood that you were pretty confident would not change that has actually shifted dramatically for you? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think, you know, I have always and to a certain extent still do have strong commitments to the values of community, uh, civility, nuance, moderateness. But in the mm -hmm. past, I've had rather dogmatic positions on what it means to be moderate. I've had inflexible <laughs> positions on nuance and I've had very narrow understandings of uncertainty. And I think I've changed my positions on those where I, I still have those earlier values, but I'm holding them a little looser in my hands and I'm trying to be more experimental around what it means to practice those values. Yeah, I will consider myself guilty at times at all. It seems that, this, that sort of dogmatism slips into life for most of us. Could you walk us through a little bit more of your journey of what what is caused you to question some of your commitment to uncertainty yeah. as a value or acceptance of uncertainty. Yeah. Well, I you know, I'm I'm not too much unlike uh John Dewey and William James in that I in my teens and early twenties I had a lot of uncertainty about who I was, what my values were, what my political commitments were. And uh, at the same time, I didn't like how there were so many people who had strong opinions on these things, but they mm -hmm. were yelling at each other all the time. And to give you a sense of this, I went to a summer camp that was Zionist socialist when I was in my early teens. And so I was being taught Howard Zinn and Foucault by mm -hmm. these camp counselors. And it was very interesting, but they were saying one thing, my parents were saying another, and I wanted folks to get along a little bit, and mm -hmm. I wasn't sure how to do that. And then I came across the writings of John Dewey and the pragmatists who we're going to explore in a bit. And it seemed like a way of reconciling my desire for community with my lingering uncertainty about how to achieve it. And it was this amazing cohesive philosophy that integrated epistemology, ethics, and politics. 
and it valued uncertainty, but it also valued mm -hmm. people's ability to get together and deliberate over how to address it. And it was something that I carried through me into grad school and into some of my political activities in Occupy Wall Street, uh, working mm -hmm. for a nonprofit, good government organization. But at the same time, some of the values and principles that were motivating me in practice could take kind of narrow forms where I had certain ideas mm -hmm. of what counts as civility, what counts as community, or what counts as generating tolerance among people. And it made me intolerant towards those who didn't have those beliefs. Like, when I was uh, in grad school, I was always the guy saying, you're essentializing too much, or there's not <laughs> enough nuance here. And when I was in politics, I would be always very wary of abstract principles and goals and wanting to be very narrow and focused on narrow reforms. And I realized not only was I kind of being the asshole in the room often or online, <laughs> as the case may be, but... I was getting in my own way and I wasn't living the values I wanted by being dogmatic about tolerance in this mm -hmm. way or dogmatic about these other things. So, you know, it took me some experiences, maybe we'll get into that to sort of reflect a little more on that. And I'm not out of the woods yet, uh, you know, <laughs> but I think I'm happy now to be a little more uncertain about how I think about uncertainty. It's all a process for all of us. You, you <laughs> mentioned abstractions and essentialism. I was wondering if you could articulate a little bit of what you mean by essentialism. Yeah, so I think essentialism is to define something by properties that are absolutely unerasable, unchangeable, mm -hmm. and are the case in any given situation. And I will tell you that when my partner was having her bridal shower, uh, there were one of those questionnaires around what are your mm -hmm. spouse's pet peeves, and mine happened to be essentialism. And everyone else <laughs> on the uh, in the bridal shower was like, w w "He hates essentialism. Like, what? What? Who did you marry? What is this?" <laughs> and my partner was like, "Yeah, actually, he does." Uh, so, <laughs> so, so this idea that that certain things have these limits. Now, this can be a problem for many things where you say, you know, the world is was created in six days, and that can't be that can't be tampered with. It can be take the form of capitalism is the only good. And it's the only just economic system. Mm -hmm. It's essentially that way. It could be the way you define somebody's educational aptitude as being essentially low level or essentially not able to advance themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm always wary of these things. And I think it comes a little bit from this desire for people to be able to change their conditions, to be able to mm -hmm. find the possibilities of uh, improving themselves or improving the world around them. And essentialism really puts a cap on that. So instead of essentialism, you know, we have these ideas of indeterminacy, of meliorist, of reformable or improvable, mm -hmm. all these other kinds of things. And, uh, you know, those can, you know, we can talk a little about some of the problems of over essentializing nuance or over essentializing complexity. But Generally, you know, when I talk about essentialism, it's the sense that things can't change. Mm -hmm. In talking of essentialism, some additional examples couldn't be of gender is essential, that yes. there's a, an inherent nature within being male or female or masculine or feminine. Or it could be, like you said, intelligence is an essential thing that oftentimes when we talk about essentialism, it's usually put in these it's in the DNA, right? It's something that's locked in and it's unchangeable. And it's right resistance to those things. And I think you put it powerfully. It's about resisting the fatalism or the inevitability of certain things and its reaction. And John Dewey very much fits into a camp who is resisting that stuff. So John Dewey, who is he? Give us some broad biographical brushstrokes. Yeah. So John Dewey um, was born in Vermont in the late 19th century, and he was born into a community that was just beginning to industrialize pretty heavily. It was a period of social conflict, of a period of where old verities, old truths seem to be being challenged through science and through, uh, through other mechanisms. So John Dewey was a philosopher. He studied at John Hopkins, mm -hmm. and he developed, along with 
many other thinkers on both sides of the Atlantic, people like T.H. Green and uh, William James, an uh, idea around knowledge, ethics, and politics that was non-deterministic, that mm-hmm. was based around consequentialism, that had an open-ended idea of how to test and verify ideas. And this is what sort of come down now as pragmatism. And he took these ideas and he applied them not just to philosophy, but he applied them to education. He applied them to social theory in books like The Public and Its Problems. He applied them to all the major pressing issues that America faced really between the 1900s and 1930s, civil rights, world wars, etc. And he really established a whole generation's worth of thinkers uh, through his students, through the people he influenced, who would really change America. So John Dewey is really at the fulcrum point of American uh, history in many ways. And he is sort of inspiring for me because he wrestled with so many of the same dilemmas I did. You know, there's a good quote uh, from him where he talks about as a young person, maybe as a lonely person seeing conflict around him, he talks about the appeal to idealism, the idea that Mm -hmm. beyond this world of conflict, there is a broader unity that can be achieved through collective inquiry, through democracy. And he writes that there was this vision of wholeness. It was a demand for unification that was doubtless an intense emotional craving, and yet a hunger that only an intellectualized subject matter could satisfy. Mm. So he was drawn in his emotions to find this ground for unity. But he was also enough of a critical thinker to realize that You can't just assume there's one way of getting this unity. There needs to be testing of it in empirical reality. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't say reality because data from science and data from testing isn't the only truth. That Mm. data from science is mediated by our own values. That data Mm -hmm. one day could change the next day. But there needs to be a dialectic, a balance between ideas and testing them. And Dewey felt it was in that back and forth that you could generate new knowledge, provisional knowledge, but new knowledge that can guide our actions intelligently and be a source of values for us moving forward. I will say I have a very strong attraction to that same impulse that Dewey had, which connects to his Hegelianism, which is that unity where it's the harmony against the conflict. It's sort of like an intellectual, emotional, warm blanket that wraps around you, I think, is yeah. how I would describe that yeah. experience. So I no, I mean, and it's a way of getting a broader perspective on conflicts where rather than see conflicts as inevitable or binary, you can see tensions between reform and revolution or between subject and object or idealism and materialism and say, no, the answer is yes, you can do both of these things and they could improve each of their goals if you use them together. It's this flexible way of viewing conflict as arriving at a higher synthesis. And some people would criticize that for being too utopian. Mm -hmm. And we could get into what that might look like in practice. But as a way of, it's such an optimistic vision that you can apply to to conflicts around you that in within this thing something better can come if we all can get find the truths of both perspectives Mm -hmm. and now there's a a, an intellectual historian james kloppenberg and he has a book entitled uncertain victory and he includes in there john dewey amongst a a group of several american and european thinkers and he refers to them as the philosophers of the via media and kloppenberg he says this about dewey we must relinquish claims to knowledge that is precise and final. The best we can do is to understand hermeneutically. We come to knowledge in the human sciences much as we come to the knowledge of a friend. And even after we peel away layers of misconception and ambiguity, something impenetrable remains because no experience other than our own is finally accessible to us from within. And and this points to pragmatism. How would you explain pragmatism and the pragmatic theory of truth, because they play a big role in John Dewey's work and what you're talking about here. Well, I think I'll I'll focus on uncertainty and John Dewey and how he tries to wrestle with these things pragmatically. So that quote is wonderful. There's the sense that no knowledge is final and knowledge can't be achieved by either 
um, logical principle, the idea that you can receive knowledge purely by deductive logic, getting the truth from on high, but you also can't get the knowledge purely from passively receiving data from the outside world, from science, because data is always mediated by your own subjectivity, by your own biases. Nothing speaks for itself. So in order to figure out what knowledge is, it's more about what knowledge does, what we hmm. do, and what the consequences of our action are. So knowledge is arrived through activity, not through contemplation. That's the number one thing for pragmatism. The other thing is, how do you, where do you test this knowledge? Where do you find the results of your activity? It's not, as we said before, in pure abstract thought, thinking of mm -hmm. eternity, but it's also available to us in some form. And it's available to us through experience. And experience is something that happens in the moment. It happens as a kind of fusion of empirical realities and our real emotions and our real values in combination with one another. And it's an experience that we test our knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the third thing about it is it's intersubjective which means that no one of us has claim to the truth. No one of us can do one of these experiments and say, well, I have the answer because we all have different perspectives, different opinions, different things to offer. And so truth comes through dialogue and deliberation over the meaning of these experiments. And mm -hmm. this can apply for knowledge, let's say, but it also can apply for politics. And this is where... I am most compelled by Dewey, this idea that all of us are affected by social consequences, let's say by mm -hmm. pollution, by income inequality, but we don't know who else is affected by them and we don't know what's causing them. And we all have theories about these things. So for Dewey, all that democracy is, or that I should say that the, the, the state is, are people together trying to experiment on what policies lead to what consequences and endlessly deliberating and trying to refine those actions, those policies, so that mm. they have better results. And in the process, so, so democracy is the means of doing this. And in order to do this, we need to be able to be empathetic towards one another, to see their perspective. We need to be in communication with one another. We have to have common values or common standards in order to speak the same language and arrive at policies or consequences that are more desirable to us. So democracy is both the means and the ends of this. We want to create a more democratic society where all of us can have a say in what affects us. And in order to do that, we engage in these deliberations. And it's not just a process of politics, but it's a process of ethics. Because in the process of deliberating, we form stronger social bonds with each other. We form empathetic ties with one another. So it's ethical, it's epistemological, and it's political. And it's also radical. Because mm -hmm. the implications of this are that in order for deliberation to happen most effectively, we need to be in solidarity with one another. We need to have an equal voice and we need to have a degree of liberty to speak what is on our minds and to really say what the effects of these political consequences are, of the effects of public policies are, right? Mm -hmm. So Dewey has this very dramatic quote and I'll read it here. The objective precondition of the complete and free use of the method of intelligence is a society in which class interests that recoil from social experimentation are abolished. It is incompatible with every social and political philosophy and activity and with every economic system which accepts the class organization and vested class interests of present society. So if you have a society where there are certain actors who don't want this democracy to happen, if you mm -hmm. don't want this kind of deliberation over what is affecting us to happen, then it's bad ethically, it's bad for knowledge, and it's bad for politics. So all of these kind of social inequalities we have today are getting in the way of a truly open democracy and all of the benefits that gives us in terms of knowledge, ethics, and politics. Let me play this back for you and let me know if I, I hit this right. So basically in Dewey's view, 
we don't have no one has a complete or totalizing view of truth and instead this fits in with democracy where if we have all of us together having our unique experiences that we connect around intersubjectivity where we can deliberate and decide on which are the issues we're going to wrestle with what are the ideas that are going to be most useful and fruitful for us and ultimately democracy is central to that because it allows us to deliberate toward there and those who are not interested in playing the process of democracy are most likely vested interest or status quo entities who are not interested in acknowledging necessary change i think that's largely true and i think that the inequalities that we have in this country or in any country inequalities prevent us from engaging in this dialogue and by extension the interests and processes that generate those inequalities right mm. so that's what we mean by vested interests here so it is a call to change things fundamentally and i'll get you know one more quote here and this is from walter littman who was a brilliant student of uh, Dewey's, at least in the terms of following his philosophy in the mm -hmm. early 1910s. And he says, there is nothing accidental than in the fact that democracy and politics is the twin brother of scientific thinking. They had to come together. As absolutism falls, science arises. It is self-government. For when the impulse which overthrows kings and priests and unquestioned creed becomes self-conscious, we call it science. So, you know, he's saying here that de democracy and it's not science in this narrow sense, but science as mm -hmm. open ended inquiry is mm -hmm. they go together. And for a grad student, that's pretty uh, exciting stuff. <laughs> yeah, there, you, there's definitely a sense in there in which for someone like Dewey that does still echo some of that unifying Hegelian thought where there seems to be all these things can kind of come together, democracy, science, epistemology, ethics in this unifying way. So yeah. it seems that Dewey never quite escapes, I guess, Hegelian viewpoints of his earlier philosophical days. And he tries to move past that, but it still kind of lingers. So John Dewey, among many other progressive and social democratic thinkers during his day, as well as other philosophers of the Via Media, they wrestled with many dichotomies, and these included laissez-faire capitalism and socialism. They're trying to find a middle way between them. These also included free will and determinism, which you talked about, empiricism and idealism. Uh, another one, really big, difficult one that I'm not sure anyone's really found a a clear resolution to, so I'm naturally going to see if you have. Um, and that <laughs> one is the the tension between decentralized democracy versus a more expert or centralized bureaucracy. How have you or do we reconciled some of these dichotomies? So I think one of the big one was reform and revolution. I think that's one of the big ones. I think that in the late 19th century, there were kind of two poles. Uh, on the one hand, there was a sort of laissez-faire liberalism that sort of accepted many aspects of society back then, private ownership of property, mm -hmm. restricted franchises, all these other things as kind of essential and good. On the other hand, you had branches of critics, people like Karl Marx or Henry George, who thought that not only were these things bad, but they were fundamentally unreformable in the sense mm -hmm. that they're being overdetermined by uh, social forces and social relations. So the example here is that, let's say for Karl Marx, the government depends on taxes for revenue. It depends on revenue mm -hmm. raised by private capitalists. There is no way that they would act against that interest to try to reform or restrain capitalism. He also felt that workers are becoming immiserated. Uh, mm -hmm. They're becoming poorer and poorer, and this is sort of an, an inevitable dynamic of capitalism. So rather than reform, he believed that things would come to a head and the tensions between a minority of capitalists and a majority of workers would become unsustainable. Mm -hmm. Now, for many people in the late 19th century who were writing after Marx, Marx's sort of... Uh, writings in the 1840s, 50s, 
they were seeing how, in fact, things were more complicated. The state mm -hmm. was democratizing. It was letting more people have the franchise. The classes were not entirely being immiserated. The working class was not being entirely immiserated. There were middle classes forming. They were different segments of the working class who were being affected unevenly by economic processes. And there was also the possibility of reform. And what this meant was you could start, rather than go directly into revolution, you could gradually ameliorate the conditions that were facing people. Mm -hmm. You could gradually exert greater public control over economic operations. And you could gradually reach the point where the private owners of the means of production, let's say, or the means of powerful finance capital, those owners are being challenged because the power of the public sector can balance this. And I think I should get here just into what we, you know, socialism is sort of at the core of a lot of what I'm about and what, uh, what a lot of uh, other of these thinkers were. And basically mm -hmm. all socialism is, is this understanding that the private ownership of economic enterprises can be a threat to liberty, equality, and solidarity. It's a mm -hmm. threat to equality because if you have one boss who can control wages and control investment, they can pose a threat to people's livelihoods uh, and well-being. Uh, it's a threat to liberty because with unequal power comes an unequal voice in society. And it's a threat to fraternity because it creates a sense of competition between many workers over limited jobs. It creates competition between those who can afford health care and education and those mm -hmm. who can't. So in all these ways, socialism sees private ownership as a problem here. And rather than do away entirely with uh, economic progress, the idea is to socialize the economy, in a sense to make us all capitalists by making all of us owners mm -hmm. of economic enterprises. And this has been posited in many different ways through worker cooperatives, through decentralization. Mm -hmm. But for democratic socialists, the usual aim is to bring about this control through democratic means, through public ownership. Now, the way of doing that for reform is to do this slow and steadily, right? Now, what I think I've started to change a little bit is to see that not all reforms are created equal. Mm -hmm. That some reforms actually legitimize and entrench the dominant processes in a society. An example of this is, you know, during the early 1900s, many states started putting up regulatory commissions. And the regulatory commissions were designed to prevent workplace abuses by large companies, uh, to prevent price gauging or gouging or uh, bad merchandise, etc. Mm -hmm. The problem was that these regulatory agencies were very soon staffed by the very same people they were meant to regulate. And you see this again mm -hmm. today, where the head of the EPA, the head of the Labor Department are the very people who want to destroy those things, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And yet the companies are following the rules. The companies are being purely legal. A non-reformist reform would be something that sets the stage up for broader and better reforms to come. So an example of this is right now cities are dependent on property taxes for revenue in America. Mm -hmm. This gives greater power to large property owners. Now, one solution is just to get out the guillotines. But another solution, uh, <laughs> maybe a little more practical, is start to displace that power by shifting the grounds of public finance away from property taxes and more towards revenue that's generated by worker cooperatives, by municipal enterprises. And even though those things aren't going to change the whole system, it's going to do many things. It's going to help give jobs to people who need it. It's going to help the economy of struggling communities often because a lot of these big taxpayers aren't necessarily helping with revenue, with, with, the, with economic growth. And it also makes the public sector a little more free because they don't have the fiscal veto power of a bunch of taxpayers who will just say, if you don't like, if, if you don't do what we say, we'll leave, right? So that mm. sets things up for broader policies to come, right? For more progressive policies to come. So that's an example of a non-reformist reform that sets things up for later stages. So that was kind of a change for me, right? Because I 
needed to not just think of reforms as what's the easiest to do, what's what's the best thing to do, uh, but sorry, what what's the easiest to do, but what's the relation of my ends to means? And this is you know one of the biggest criticisms of something that Dewey did in the 1910s about how he understood the relation of means to ends. I would like to know what is your viewpoint on a land value tax as an alternative to address some of the inequalities and addressing some of these ends you're trying to reach? I should say first, John Dewey was an enormous advocate of Henry George's land value tax, and Mm. he consistently criticized the New Deal in the 1930s from a Georgist position because he was saying how all these federal grants on behalf of homeowners, on behalf of struggling industries through new Mm -hmm. infrastructure projects, all of the benefit of that revenue, of that funding, is going to go to landlords whose properties will raise in value because of uh, those reforms. And the way of stopping that would be to levy taxes that would capture any upward increment growth in -hmm. land value. Now, I think that's a great way of raising revenue and potentially it can uh, have a lot of other positive effects too in how we use land. It can erode land speculation. It can redistribute wealth, all these things. But there is sort of a problem, which is that is the goal of the land value tax to get rid of land speculation or is it in fact to encourage more growth? And what I mean Mm -hmm. by this is, I'll give a historic example. In the early 1900s, New York City and many other cities had Henry George advocates, advocates of the land value tax, Mm. on their tax commission. And they wanted to promote real estate development because that was the only way to get that land value up and to get Mm them to tax it. So just because you have this tax doesn't mean it's going to prevent vested interests from wanting to promote real estate development to increase the returns on that tax, right? So the tax alone is important, but it's it needs to be understood with how it can reinforce certain patterns of development. You know, the state can be as much of a capitalist as anything else in the sense of wanting to maximize revenue for itself. Dewey and amongst these other philosophers of the Via Media, there's really a lot of emphasis on historicism and the community-based nature of truth addressing political problems. As you talked about, they tended toward reform as compared to revolution. I'm curious, and I want to take this to a more personal place of your own specific local communities for you. What what are some political reforms that you would like to see that you think would be a huge benefit to those local communities? Yeah. But also some even bigger ones for the United States, if you want to offer up some of those. I'm interested. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that what I said about public finance certainly fits a lot with that. But I think you know, the kind of reforms now where we have these too big to fail banks that basically are able to act with a kind of autonomy because so many uh, in the public sector and the private sector rely upon them for loans. You know, this is an enormous concentration of power of wealth and it can't be done away with instantly. But I still think that by encouraging other forms of wealth building and of uh, banking, you can start to chip away at that power. It's not just about the reforms. It's about how can you develop reforms that actually improve the ability of certain groups to win greater power rather than just reforms that ameliorate people's lives, which are which is great, but that still leave them dependent on the next election cycle to see if those reforms are going to be uh, reproduced by another administration, let's say. You're alluding to here some of the the uncertainty that Dewey and some of these other thinkers were trying to accommodate for and acknowledge. And you're touching on this notion of some potential bad actors and some of the dangers of having a politics of uncertainty. Could you elaborate a bit more on what some of these dangers have been and how they've played out? you know, I think the the greatest example here is um, during World War I, John Dewey was an advocate of the Great War, of the U.S. intervention. Mm -hmm. And he believed this because on a pragmatic level, he didn't really see an alternative. He felt that the power of the U.S. government was such that it was going to get involved anyway. And rather than sit on the sidelines, he believed, 
progressive intellectuals should join the war and try to use it for their own ends. And what he meant is, in order to fight a war, maybe as part of that, the government could nationalize some industries, or it could try to mm -hmm. improve working conditions for people in the factories. And so he was trying to be pragmatic and seeing the war as a means to another end. And he was criticized heavily from this, both from Marxists, let's say, who just felt he was caving in, but a more generous mm -hmm. critique was from a, a, a former adherent to pragmatism, uh, who was Randolph Bourne, who was an amazing social critic in the 1900s, 1910s. And he had this great line about Dewey in this later essay called Twilight of the Idols. And he said, mm -hmm. to those of us who have taken Dewey's philosophy almost as our American religion, it never occurred that values could be subordinated to techniques. We were instrumentalists, but we had our own private utopias so clearly before our minds that the means always fell into its place as contributory. And Dewey, of course, always meant his philosophy when taken as a philosophy of life to start with values. But there was always that unhappy ambiguity in his doctrine as to just how values were created. And it became easier and easier to assume that just any growth was justified and almost any activity valuable so long as it achieved ends. And there was this kind of unpragmat unpragmatic approach towards Dewey here, where mm -hmm. rather than see really carefully whether your means were going to lead to those ends, um, he kind of just assumed that they would. And, he, and Bourne went on to have this great line, the defect of any philosophy of adaptation or adjustment even when it means adjustment to changing living experience, is that there is no provision for thought or experience getting beyond itself. If your mm. ideal is to be adjust is to be adjusted to the situation in radiant cooperation with reality, then your success is likely to be just that and no more. And in the case of World War I, there wasn't even a success because the power of the government was able to subdue all those reforms that Dewey had wanted. So what this means for me is that you need to be able to really think carefully about what your means are going to accomplish. And that means drawing from different social theories that might have uncomfortable things to say about how deterministic some kinds of social structures are. Like people like Max Weber, sociologists, who mm -hmm. think that states are very resistant to reform or can deflect them or adapt them for their own purposes. People like Foucault, who would say that ideas of moderateness and civility are actually can be used to justify power and inequality mm -hmm. and exclusion, right? And these are kind of tough nuts to swallow because you want to say, well, no, anything is capable of reform, or yes, we know that Foucault, but we're going to try anyway. But in order for you to evaluate these reforms uh, and their efficacy, you need to sometimes draw from rather difficult theories that are by their nature a little abstract because mm -hmm. you're trying to project what might happen. And I think that pragmatism at its best is very playful and inventive and creative about trying an idea on for size and seeing, well, what's it like if we try Foucault? What's it like if we try Marx? But other strains of pragmat pragmatists can become very narrow and say, we're not going to truck at all with abstraction. We're not going to truck mm -hmm. at all with things that seem dangerous or extreme. And we're going to stay in this kind of narrow channel. And what they, what they fail to recognize is their own beliefs can have these kind of untested principles and assumptions that they need to direct towards themselves, right? So, you know, I think that this was this is one of the big problems with defining things as moderate or nuanced. It's a power move. It's a way mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. avoiding responsibility for testing those ideas because you've already assumed they're moderate and uh, they're the way to go, right? Another example here is around civility, where I, for me personally, I was always wary of people yelling at each other over their beliefs of of these kind of essentialist claims about race and gender what those mean mm -hmm. what those entail and 
there were many times I got in kind of arguments online or in person about these kinds of things. But then I was sort of realizing in my classes, like I'm being the asshole, I'm not contributing to <laughs> civility. And rather than reject these different opinions, maybe I should see that there's a way of achieving community through listening to anger and through responding in a way that's not just a shut, shutting it down, right? And, um, you know, one of the people who inspired me here was Audre Lorde, uh, this amazing mm -hmm. uh, New York poet and philosopher and thinker, uh, this person of color. And she's an ad she loves Whitman. She believes in solidarity. She believes in intersectionality. But she also has an amazing essay on the utility of anger and anger mm -hmm. as a way of clarifying people to each other, of a way of actually dismissing or, or getting away some of these biases that we have or these assumptions and if at it being a form of truth and that could be taken too far, but you know, in reading it, it kind of shook me a little bit. And it reminds me of all these other examples, like people who were kind of the new atheists in the nineties and early two thousands who felt like religion is incompatible with rationality and reason and how they could take that belief to kind of uncomfortably, you might almost say fanatical levels, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, history is rife with these kinds of things. And it just makes me want to slow down a little bit. And it makes me want to look at things that might seem on their surface to be antithetical to my values around anger and abstraction and essentialism and not to shut that down immediately, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this amazing essay I read not so long ago by Peter Elbow, this author of uh, of writing, of English, I guess. And it's called The Uses of Binary Thinking. And mm -hmm. when I first read this, I was like, what, what could this possibly mean? But what it just means is rather than take two sets of conflicting ideals and assume that they're incompatible or to create a kind of too quick Hegelian synthesis, where it's like, oh, it'll all come out all right in the end. Individual liberty is the same as social equality. And just mm. imagine they easily overlap. What this means is getting these two ideas, holding them in place, even if they seem dramatically opposed and dramatically essentialist and saying, how can these things inform one another? How, where do these diverge? Where do these converge? And what can we do with holding both of them in our heads at the same time. And this idea of the non-reformist reform is one of those things where mm -hmm. you see reform as a pathway to broader changes, but not just any reform. It needs to fulfill certain criteria. And you're always going back and reassessing these categories, but I don't know, it, it really was helpful to me to think in, the, in these terms, the uses of holding these two things together of binary thinking. Now, I have to applaud you here for, on the one hand, you've sort of valorized uncertainty, showed a lot of its benefits, and you've also offered some challenges on how we can sometimes be dogmatic about uncertainty. You've also celebrated and showed some of the benefits of Dewey and his legacy of thought. I'm wondering, who do you find to be some of his most rigorous critics? You know, I mentioned Randolph Bourne before, but I think another one would be um, would be uh, Jack Diggins, who was a uh, professor of mine at the CUNY Graduate Center, who was a historian of conservatism, of American ideas, of the left. He wrote an amazing book, Promise of Pragmatism, and mm. he sort of goes through how many of the deep assumptions of James, of Dewey, of all the pragmatists, he sort of contests a little bit of them. Like democracy can be defined as, you know, the tyranny of the majority, right? Mm -hmm. Is truth supposed to be that, just the tyranny of the majority? W.E. Du Bois, in fact, called democracy, the great black activist, um, W.E.B. Du Bois once called democracy a kind of tyranny. Right? Is mm. that how we want to justify decisions <laughs> in politics and in epistemology? And he also had this really good thing about testing ideas, which is just that pragmatists talk a good game about looking to the past for knowledge. But in reality, the pragmatists really disregard the past because they always are wanting to revise assumptions inherited from the past. And it's very difficult to test a theory because you can always say in the future, 
oh, well, the procedure wasn't right. Uh, the, qua the, the people, that was a fluke, all these other kinds of things. So all these things around democracy, testability, they're not as simple as, as self-obvious as they, as they might seem. And I think one of the biggest ones he brings up is Dewey got it wrong in World War I, but he also got it wrong in World War II because Dewey actually opposed the United States intervention in World War II. Mm -hmm. And during he was going to deliver a speech at Cooper Union on December, December 7th, 1941. And he was kind of caught uh, flat-footed. He didn't know what to say because his theory of, well, America should be isolationist, I've learned my lesson, it didn't bear itself out. And a lot of other folks who were kind of more fanatical about wanting to help the allies, you know, we kind of look more kindly on them than the isolationists, mm -hmm. right? So I don't know. I think Diggins in some ways was good about this. And I think Max Weber also, uh, who, you know, whereas Dewey felt that many of these binaries between bureaucracy and democracy, and democracy or expertise and democracy or um, means and ends more generally, Dewey felt these things could be reconciled harmoniously. Mm -hmm. Weber was really attendant to power in a way that Dewey wasn't, and to say how vested interests and institutions today have a whole range of techniques to deflect criticism, to incorporate criticism, and to shape the terrain of knowledge to the point where we define our own values and our own interests in light of what we think is possible based on the powers that be, to use an old expression, right? So I think some of Dewey's best critics are those who, on the one hand, like Randolph Bourne, felt that he wasn't being uh, consistent with his own pragmatist values by not thinking about the relation of means to ends, and on the other hand, his best critics are those like Diggins and, Va and Max Weber, who see that how he can be in attendance to power and the way that power can work to distort the best of intentions and frustrate uh, the best laid plans. Well, Daniel, I appreciate you coming on the show, talking to us about John Dewey and what a politics of uncertainty might look like. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, uh, I'm... Still trying to work things out, but being able to talk about them with you is enormously helpful, and I think it's what John Dewey would have wanted. Thank you for listening to Damn the Absolute. I hope you found our conversation worthwhile. We would love it if you could leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that is Stitcher, iTunes, CastBox, or one of the many other options available to you. It goes a long way in helping us to build a community committed to fruitful ideas. See you next time.